Thank you very much for coming right now. And uh, like Aisha said, I am here at Shakir University. I am a postdoc in the history department. Uh, I'm here till July. I finished my thesis in 2015. And uh, just a couple things before we start, I'll let you know. This uh, is being recorded, and this video will be available online afterwards. So you don't have to worry about recording everything that I say. I also have a free ebook that summarizes this information that I think you can get on Google Books and uh, Smashwords, other book platforms. And I'll show you at the end of this where you can find it. And I'll leave plenty of time at the end for any questions that you have. So I'll speak for about half an hour or so, and then whatever you have to say. Uh, a few things I should warn you about before I get started. Uh, I'd like to thank the history department for hosting this lecture, but this is not an academic lecture. This is uh, not anything close to that. In May, I'm going to talk about my research. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you're more than welcome to come. But this is not an academic discussion. This is more of, I guess, a personal story of my different experiments with how to write uh, a doctoral dissertation. And it also applied, uh, it can apply to a master's thesis as well. I didn't come to my writing methods based off of any uh, research that I did or any theoretical insight. It was complete trial and error. Um, I also came to this deci decision on how I wrote on the idea that I don't want to spend 12 years writing the perfect doctoral dissertation. And if that's your goal, or if you want to spend four or five years writing the perfect master's thesis, then we're probably going to disagree, and that's fine. Um, my professors studied in the United States, and there, if you do a doctoral thesis, there's a pressure that you have to learn about eight languages, you have to research in archives on four or five continents. And your first advisor needs to die because you've been in your program so long, and then when you're on your second advisor, then you can finish. Well, I did my doctorate in Europe, and there's more of a pressure to get it out faster, so I think that this could apply to us a little bit more. So a bit more about me. I did my doctorate at Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. And on all accounts, it was a great experience. I had great professors. Uh, I study Ottoman history. My dissertation topic was about uh, religious polemics, uh, in uh, Turkish, I guess, Arabic. Uh, at the end, it was 470 pages long. And overall, it was good. My advisors were very supportive. I had good departmental support and funding to do my research. I was able to come to Turkey on research trips. And overall, it was really positive. I spent five years from beginning to end to be able to finish it. Uh, some other things I do, along with uh, doing academic research, I've also written a couple of popular history books. These are two of them. One is called History's Greatest Generals, and the second, The Most Powerful Women in the Middle Ages. The reason I mention this is because for a long time, I had a lot of problems writing academically. I just didn't know how to write. And when I finally developed a good method to do so, it didn't really come from the academic world. It actually came from when I was doing non-academic popular history book writing. So that's why I mentioned that there. Uh, so first, let me tell you a little bit about my story and where I was. Uh, I started my doctoral program in 2010. For the first year, I did my coursework. I studied Ottoman Turkish to flesh it out more. Uh, then I finished my qualification exams. My second year, I did more language research. I looked at Persian and Arabic and uh, Armenian, and I started doing research for my dissertation. By my third year, I was ready to start writing. I was still researching and I was continuing to research, but I was ready to begin the writing process. Here's my problem. I would sit down at my computer, and it was completely impossible for me to write. The reason was, I had no idea how to write. The way that I, the way that I knew how to write was I would be in a class with other master's students, or I would be in a doctoral student seminar, 
And what we would do is uh, we'd spend a seminar on a topic, maybe, I don't know, for me, early Ottoman history, um, a study of Ottoman and Islamic borderlands. I would read some books, I'd read 20 or 30 articles. For the end of the semester, I would take everything I read, I would synthesize it in my mind, then I would write a research paper based on my complete understanding of everything I wrote. And that works out well for a graduate class. That does not work for writing a MA thesis or a doctoral thesis or a dissertation. I thought, well, how am I supposed to write? I haven't read everything. I haven't read all my sources. What, what do I say? I'm trying to um, describe this historical thing that happens and then also explain it at the same time. But how do I explain it if I don't understand all of it? It felt like I jumped out of an airplane and I was trying to build the parachute as I was falling. Uh, so I just didn't know where to begin. Uh, so what a, day, what a normal day would look like for me is I would sit down at my computer to write. Maybe I'd read some historical sources. I would write one or two sentences. I would stop. I would go back. I would delete it. I would try to write again. I, I just knew that it wasn't right. And I'd work for maybe three or four hours and I would have almost nothing to show for it. Here's the reason why, the main reason why it was so hard for me to write. When I was writing, it's like I was trapped in a mental border. Here's what I mean by that. When you are in a graduate student class, for most of us, at least for me, maybe I would start talking about an article or a book, and I would say, there is an emergence of Islamic modernism in the late 19th century in Istanbul. And then my professor would interrupt me, or another student would interrupt me and say, oh, 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 you can't use that word. You have to qualify it. What about Selim Derengil and Usama Matisi and Umar Riyad's research on this? And then, and then we would argue about terminology, and then we would get more and more and more specific and go back and forth like this for hours. And it's a good process because you learn how to be very clear in your thinking. And you learn how to be precise with your language and precise with your ideas. That's very helpful. This is terrible when you're trying to write. I would imagine when I would sit down at my computer that I was in a seminar room, my professor was there, other graduate students were there, and when I would try to write, I would make one or two sentences, my professor would critique me, then another student would critique me, so I would try to rewrite the paragraph, but then I knew it wasn't right, and um, I would add a second paragraph, but then my imaginary professor would say that my second paragraph disagrees with my first paragraph. So I have to delete my first paragraph. But then my second paragraph doesn't make sense without my first paragraph, so I have to delete the second paragraph. So I worked for an entire day, and I have nothing to show for it. Um, so this is what it was like when I was trying to write, and it was miserable. If any of you know the misery that comes with being a master's student, some of it is this. You work for hours and hours, and you have nothing to show for what you've been doing all day. When the thing that would make me miserable the fastest, if is somebody asked me, the worst question is, when will you finish? But then, how's it going? How's your thesis going? And I would just think about trying to write in this process. Here's how I was finally able to start making progress. Uh, I got help from a writer with impressive sideburns, uh, who's now deceased, named Isaac Asimov. Uh, Isaac Asimov is one of the most famous science fiction writers of the 20th century. I'm a huge science fiction nerd. I read all of Asimov's Foundation series when I was in junior high. And I learned something interesting about Isaac Asimov. So he's a famous science fiction writer, but in his lifetime, he also wrote 500 books. He wrote uh, books in science fiction, but also nine out of 10 categories in the Dewey Decimal System on religion, philosophy, history, uh, Shakespeare, the history of the slide rule, anything you could imagine. That's approximately one book every two weeks for 25 years. So I was curious, how did he do this? And he's also an academic. He has a PhD, I think, in uh, biochemistry. And he has a lot of things to say about it. But the most important thing that he would do is every day he would write as fast as simply as he could. And then later he would go back over it and change it. But for Isaac Asimov, the first draft that he wrote of anything, when he had a mental border, what he would do 
is he would tell everybody to go away. If he had a professor in his mental boardroom, he would tell the professor to go away. He would tell other people to go away until it's just him there. So when he would write his first draft, he would just be by himself. There were no critical voices to tell him to erase this or to include that. And that's how he would write his first draft. So that made me start to think differently about how I approach it. Here's the thing that he said about writing, that he decides what he writes to be very clear. He said, I made up my mind long ago to follow one cardinal rule, to be clear. I've given up all thought of writing poetically or symbolically or experimentally or any other modes that might, if I were good enough, get me a Pulitzer. I would write merely clearly and in this way establish a warm relationship between myself and my readers. And the professional critics, well, they can do whatever they wish. Now this doesn't apply to all academic writing. Some academic writing by its nature needs to be complicated and use precise, uh, dare I say it, even cumbersome terminology. But I think this is something to consider when you're writing the first draft, where you don't worry about being really sophisticated and using precise, elegant language that would please your most critical professor. Your first draft, you just write as clearly and as simply as fast as you can. And then afterwards, you can begin the editing process. And I'll get to more on that in a second, but first I want to uh, mention some other things. This is a fantastic book, I can't recommend highly enough, called Writing Your Dissertation in 15 Minutes a Day. One quote that I love from it is, first you make a mess, then you clean it up. Here's what that means. It means that when you write your very first draft, like what Isaac Asimov did, you don't have anyone else in your mental boardroom, you write as fast and as messy and as quickly as you possibly can. It doesn't matter if your first paragraph and your second paragraph don't link up with each other. You can have spelling mistakes. You can have things that don't line up perfectly. When you're writing your first draft, the most important thing is that you're making steady progress. When you get all of your information on the page, then you can start to make sense of it. But trying to make sense of something before you write is much more difficult. When I wrote the first draft of my dissertation, I called it my vomit draft, because I just vomited the information on the page. And I realized, why am I, try why am I giving myself so much agony trying to make a perfect first draft? Nobody writes a perfect first draft. Uh, <coughs> if you ever are able to see early drafts of uh, famous writers' works or famous poems, you'll be shocked at how bad the first draft of anything is. Uh, I, it, it's just shocking how bad it is. And I have copies of the first draft of my dissertation. It would, it would get flunked out of a master seminar, I'm sure of it, because the thoughts are disorganized. There's not a clear thesis. But I was able to take that first draft and then use it as a basis to make a second draft, and then a third draft, and a fourth draft, and then it started to come together. Let me get uh, drilled down even more into how do you make that first draft? So I said it's important just to take your ideas and put it on the page. Okay, that's great, but how do you actually do that? What are practical steps of going about that? This is another, uh, we're getting into the realm of behavioral psychology now, and uh, Jerry Seinfeld actually has a technique that was enormously helpful. I'm also a huge uh, Seinfeld fan as a child of the 90s. And now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how do you write every day? When you're trying to produce your first draft, you don't worry if it's good or not. But in order to produce it, you can't just have a 10 hour writing binge on Saturday. You need to have a regular process of writing every single day. And how do you do that? Well, here was one method that Jerry Seinfeld has. It has nothing to do with academia, but I think it's relevant. He said, for my stand up comedy routine, I need to have good jokes. To produce good jokes, I need to have a lot of jokes. Then I can take a lot of them and cut them down to the good one, good ones. How do I produce a lot of jokes? Here's something that he did, and I used a modified approach to this. He said, just take two things. Just take a giant wall calendar and a red marker. If your goal, if his goal, let's say, was to produce five jokes a day, once he finished his five joke goal, he would take his red marker and then put an X through the calendar. Then the next day, if he finished his goal, he would do it again. 
and then he would do it again. And over time, you start to see a chain build up. Here, there's something that happens uh, psychologically that we're not aware of, and it's not something that's logical, but it's how our subconscious works. There's a behavioral economic theory called loss prevention. Basically, what it means is that you work much harder to not lose something than to gain something. You work much harder not to lose five lira than to earn five lira. It's not logical, but it's how we're wired psychologically. What that means is, if you have a chain that you've developed, if you realize that you're not going to meet your goal and your chain is gonna be broken and there's a white spot here, your brain actually sends signals of pain to you. And you actually, um, your subconscious is motivating you to keep going. This is on its face uh, a silly thing. It's just a wall calendar. But psychologically, it's something that actually means something. And our brain is sending us small signals of pain to finish up. You might think, well, how does that work? Let me show you exactly what I did to implement the strategy when I was writing my doctoral dissertation. And you can use it the exact same way for a master's thesis of how I broke it down. This was a spreadsheet that I made. And here are the columns. This is just the day's date. The chapter I worked on that day, the words at the beginning of my session, the words at the end, the total number of words, and then the words for the day. The only columns that really matter are the day's date and then your total number of words. You can have those other things. You don't really need them. It's up to you, but that's how I did it. Here's what I would do. I decided that I would have a goal for the first draft of my dissertation to write 500 words every day. And because I decided that it didn't have to be good, it didn't matter how good the words were. If I had to write, I hate my life 120 times, that was fine. The most important thing was getting in the 500 words. And inevitably, when I started writing, then my thought processes would unclog, and I could start to get good momentum and uh, get things going. Sorry about that. Let me get rid of that pop-up. Okay, you'll notice a couple things here. I did not write my dissertation in order. Uh, sometimes in the same day, I would be on chapter one, then chapter three, and chapter five, because if I happened to write something that was relevant to chapter five, I would put it down. Um, I would worry about logical order when it came to the editing phase, and I'll show you that in a second. Here's what it was like for me. The first day that I did this, it was hard to reach my 500 word goal. I still had the habits of having my professors in my mental boardroom, and I had to work multiple times to kick them out. Uh, and it took some time. The first day probably took me between three and five hours to write those first 500 words. And finally, I think I just had to work on my bibliography because I knew that I could do that and um, I wouldn't have to think very hard about it. You really, once you know Chicago style or whatever it is, it, it, there's really not, a bibliography is plenty black and white. So the first week or so, it took about three or four hours to get through my 500 words. But something interesting happened after one or two weeks. It started to become much easier to write. I knew, I had a better sense of how to write. I felt more comfortable doing it. And it's a process that became much faster. Some days, it only took one or two hours to be able to produce this. Or, I would, some days I would just only focus on writing one big footnote. If you do history, you know that a footnote can sometimes be 500 words long. So I would think, okay, today I'm writing a footnote about Alevis in uh, the Ottoman Empire. So here's a footnote on Eifer Karafaya Stump's book, and then I mention uh, Kofru's work on it, other things like that. This thing right here, if you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember this, of keeping track of your writing progress. This had an absolutely enormous impact on my mood throughout the day. It was a night and day difference. Before I started writing every day, like I told you, I would end the day feeling depressed, that I worked hard, but I didn't have anything to show for it. I would write things and then erase it and then come back. After this, I felt like I had something to show for all of my work. I knew that I was making small progress toward finishing my dissertation. And my mood just changed dramatically. My wife said that the difference was 
dramatic, how, how much uh, at ease, how much less anxious, and how much happier I was. Now, you don't need 500 words a day. Uh, it depends on what your discipline is. If it's applied mathematics, then there's a higher content to word ratio. So I don't know, maybe 20 words or 50 words a day is for you. Maybe you're working one or two jobs, and you can only do one or 200 words a day. The important thing is that you have a goal and you stick to it. It's not so much the word count, it's how many words you write. That's the most important thing. Another thing I would start to do as I got into the groove of this is, uh, there's a close up of the words at the beginning and the words at the end, uh, like you saw a second ago. I started leaving notes to myself about what I was going to write the next day. So when I got to the end of my 500 words, I'd say, okay, um, there's a source, there's some Wikipedia page, but it has a link to another source, and I should look at that source. So I would leave my note in the next morning, I would look at that, and I'd say, use stuff from Johann Strauss article about the Tufe Tu, along with Aiden's book. And then I'd say, oh, there's a doctoral dissertation you should look at. So that way, the next day when I started writing, I, would, I could look at these notes and think, okay, I'm gonna work on this today, and I could start. I got really, um, thorough about my writing after a while. Because I realized how good I felt when I hit my 500 words. My brain would dump endorphins into my bloodstream, and I felt like I had just ran five kilometers. So I wanted that sensation at the beginning of the day, because I knew that after I finished my writing goal, whatever I did the rest of the day, even if I spent 10 hours watching season four of Breaking Bad, it didn't matter. I could do whatever I wanted to. So what I would do is the night before, I would open my laptop, I would open up my Word document with my writing, I would open up the articles I was, or the historical documents I was going to be looking at, whatever. Then I would just put my computer on sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I would turn my computer on, all of my documents would be there, and I would try to start writing as fast as possible. It's like if you're a swimmer uh, and you want to swim every day, it's best to just jump into the pool, even if you're not awake. Just jump right into it and get going. So I could finish very quickly, and this was, um, at least for me, I mean, you might be different, we're all wired differently, but it was a good method to go forward. Let me introduce just a little bit of analytical data to give you some more information about how you can make sure that you can lock in a daily writing goal. I wanna mention something I read in a consumer report uh, about this running app called Nike Plus. Nike Plus is a sensor system, it's kind of like Fitbit, Basically, it's a sensor you attach to your shoe, and if you're a runner, it will sync with your iPhone or your uh, Android phone or whatever. And it will show every day how far you ran. Here's an example of the analytical data it does. It shows how far you ran, your specific route with GPS, and then the total amount of running that you've done over time. Why am I mentioning this? Here's why I'm mentioning it. Nike had data of millions of runners, and they came across an interesting statistic. They found out that if a person only ran one time or two times, they weren't going to keep up the habit. Three times, maybe a little bit more likely. But if a person uploaded their running data five times, statistically, they were far more likely to run for months or even years and develop a permanent running habit. There's something about the number five that if you do something five times in a row, you will be much more likely to develop a long-term habit. What that means for us is if you can make a spreadsheet, make yourself a writing goal, 100 words, 200 words, 500 words a day. If you can do it five times, then you are finished with the first draft of your thesis. It's not quite that simple, but it almost is. You are much more likely to have a daily writing habit where you will be able to produce every day. It's kind of hard the first week, but after one or two weeks, you get used to the process of writing, you feel more comfortable doing it, and you can keep going. So do it five times. Now here's the third thing I want to mention, how to write even if your research isn't finished. Some people might disagree with me on this, and that's perfectly fine. Like I said, I didn't do copious amounts of research before I developed my personal writing method. I just tried it, and it worked for me. But 
One of the problems I had for my doctoral dissertation is that I knew I wasn't finished with my research. Like I said, mine was on religious polemics between Christian and Muslim intellectuals. And there were about 15 or 20 major works that I was looking at, and then dozens of other documents, uh, government reports, newspaper articles, and all the other things that a historian, historian looks at. So if I had 15 major books, let's say I had read five of them total. And I thought, well, do I have to read everything before I can start writing? Um, because what if I start writing and it turns out that I discover something new that changes what it is I'm doing? What I did was, uh, the, the advice that I got from the book, Writing 15 Minutes a Day, is that the process of writing is not a process where you intellectually understand something, your brain processes it, and then it flows perfectly into your fingertips as you're writing at the computer. It's more like a synthesis. It's a dialectic between writing and thinking, where in the process of writing, you understand your research in ways that you didn't before. Here's what I mean by this. Uh, in terms of communication theory, some people are external processors. It means that some people don't understand their own thoughts until they've spoken them aloud, until they've talked about it with somebody else. Other people are internal processors. What this does with writing is that sometimes you could write something and when you go back over your first draft, a lot of it is messy. But you might be surprised to think, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I knew that. I, this was something that must have been in my subconscious mind. But that was interesting what I did there, how I linked these two ideas together. I found a lot of those things in the first draft of my dissertation. When I finished my first draft, I thought it would be absolutely terrible, and most of it was. But there were some parts where I was surprised at things that I didn't know that I knew. Where in the process of writing, I was able to work with the information that I would not have been aware of if I were doing everything mentally. <laughs> now, as you're, so I would recommend that as you start to research, begin the writing process. And if you dis discover something later, that changes your basic theory, that's fine. Go back and change it. That's why you have a messy first draft. It's there to be changed. I've read a lot of doctoral dissertations, and almost every introduction starts the same way. Somebody says, I was researching this topic, and I'd spent a few years doing it, but then I discovered this other source that completely changed my research. So that happens to everyone, and it's fine. If you have to go back and change something, that's just part of the research process. And a lot of writing won't be affected by, not a lot, but a fair amount of writing won't be affected by something you discover later. If you know that there are four or five authors in your field whose ideas are influential and you have to talk about them uh, and summarize their research, just write that. That won't really be changed based on what you discover later. So as you start to write, you'll, I would argue, be able to research more effectively. For me, when I was researching religious polemics, I wrote about three or four of them. And in the process of writing, I was able to become much better at analyzing their contents so that when I was reading something else, I could come to it with more experience about how to approach the material. I knew that, well, most of what I'm looking for is an introduction and conclusion, and I'm not going to neglect it. I'm still going to look over it. But I at least had a better sense of how to approach the sources. And I wasn't always right, but I was, um, I, I was able to approach it more thoroughly. So you can start writing about what you already have researched. And in the process, I think you'll discover ideas and concepts that you didn't even know you knew. And it will, I think, give you more experience as you approach other sources. Let me give you an example of how I did this. Um, this is just a small thing, but I had a lot of problems when I was trying to think up the name of my dissertation. This is something from PhD Comics, uh, which please read just to give yourself some kind of like mental release. This is like a really funny diagram of how do you come up with a title of your dissertation. First, a witty catchphrase, colon. Then some really complicated uh, description of what it is in a for obscure topic few people care about. So it could be, an Ottoman tragedy, 
a literary analytical reading of the death of Sultan Osman II in 1622. I mean, something like that. Or there's always some like clever little thing here. And I, this this is ridiculous, but it, it caused me a lot of stress. I think what should the top, what should the title of my dissertation be? It has to be very clever. I have to show people how clever I am, and they'll know how clever I am based on the title of my dissertation. Before, I would try to think in my mind, okay, I, I have to spit it out. But once I developed this process of first writing and then going back and editing, I thought, you know, I'm just going to start putting down ideas. And in the process of writing down ideas, I think I'll get close. So this was something I just pulled up today of how I went through this. First, I looked at, I just compiled a big list of dissertation titles that I liked. So these are other people's dissertations. And you see what I'm talking about? It follows the same thing. Clever title, colon, then whatever else. The Politics of Piety, the Ottoman Ulama in the Post-Classical Age. Power in the Periphery, the Hamidian Light Cavalry. Uh, my master's thesis title was something ridiculous. I, what was it? I think it was Centers of Provocation and Progress. I had to have the two words match up with letters. So, something like that before the colon. So here's how I went through it. This was my first uh, title, Religion in the Modern Era. I just threw this down. Ottoman Christian Muslim polemics and interreligious debate. I thought, OK, that doesn't work. That's too vague. And then I wrote, narrating modernity, civilization. No, that doesn't work. Disputing religion, modernity. OK, I like disputing, because it, it, I, it's an important theoretical concept for my research. And then, as you can see going down the list, I start to zero in a little bit more. Um, I, I went through more, probably like 15 or 20 different versions. And then the final was disputing religion, empire, modernity, Christian Muslim polemics, and the Ottoman Prince here, 1861 and 1915. Still dense to non-outsiders, but that's what a dissertation is. So I, I show you that process because I didn't try to think up the perfect title and then let it come out. I just wrote down a bunch of titles, and then I kept writing. I saw, I saw things that I liked. I thought, OK, I like the word disputing because that's an important rhetorical concept that I use. I need print sphere, and then I was able to finally zero in on it. So that's an idea of how I use this process. OK, so you have the first copy of your thesis. Like I said, you put the information on the page. You just wrote quickly, and now you have to edit it. How do you edit it? What you do now is when you have all the information that you think you'll need on the page, you start to invite back your professor and other graduate students in your mental boardroom. You start to use that critical reading that um, I think shouldn't be there the first time, but is necessary on um, this editing phase. The first time you edit is difficult, because you're trying to group together all of the ideas in a logical way. You're trying to write in a clear way. And your first draft, you weren't concerned about clarity or organization, and now you are. This, I think, is the most difficult part of the editing stage. I also had problems when I was doing this because I didn't know how to begin the editing process. I would see it on my computer, but it was really hard for me to be able to take a step back and organize information in a logical way because it was 430 pages long. I also have a nasty tendency to repeat myself. Uh, my advisor was just furious with me reading one of my drafts. She said, you repeated yourself just five or six times. Please, once is enough. Here, here's how I did this. Um, this is a method that seemed to work pretty well. What I did was I took one chapter. I just took one chapter. I think each one is approximately 50, 50 pages long for mine. Uh, for your thesis, however long it is, that's fine. I printed it, I printed it all out. And I took all the pages, and then I put them on the floor of my living room. Then I took a pen, and I looked at it, and I was able to get a big picture of it that I couldn't get if it were all on my laptop. And I could see, OK, uh, page 6, uh, this topic actually belongs on page 10. Uh, this thing on page 30, that actually belongs on page 10 also. Let's see, page 15, I'm repeating myself. OK, cross that out. Page 22, uh, that actually belongs in chapter 2. I'll move that over here. 
So by spending some time going over this and getting a big view, I was able to group together logical concepts. I was able to see that something I thought was really important actually didn't work in my dissertation, or it just wasn't necessary and it was distracting. Uh, the big challenge I had when I was editing is I had to delete a lot because sometimes we can overwrite. Um, and that was uh, what came out in this uh, version. I told you earlier that I had a writing goal of 500 words a day on my first draft. When I came to the editing phase, what I would do is my goal was that I would try to edit a certain number of pages per day. I would print out some pages, I would take a pen, um, after I did the big overview and crossed stuff out, then I would pick it up and actually write things in the margins and either rewrite a sentence that wasn't written very well or I would cross out things or I would insert a place saying, okay, I need to mention the research of this historian here. And my goal was that uh, I would go through five pages of it like that. And then after I was done going through it, writing, then I would actually type it onto my computer because the typing part required less mental energy. And I always try to do the thing that requires more mental energy in the beginning, because if I try to do the hard thing later, I probably just won't do it. So I'll find an excuse not to do it, so that's how I would go about it. Okay, uh, this next thing, how to overcome challenges, this is really vague. Let me tell you what I mean. Uh, in the process of writing your master's thesis or doctoral dissertation, all of us have different challenges when we write it. Let me uh, give you an idea of what I mean by a question. Um, this is really vague. There's no wrong answer. But just uh, if anyone wants to, they can just shout out what they think. What are some reasons it's so hard to be a good graduate student? Does anyone have any uh, opinion on this? You can just shout out any idea that you have. Designation of older teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have enough time. I mean, that's a big one, so. Time management, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of your responsibilities are mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of uh, different ideas, but a lot of it is that we're extremely busy, we don't have very much time, and that is, um, that's absolutely true, and that was a huge thing that made it hard for me to first start writing. There's another thing that made it um, hard for me when I was going, too, and I realized this when I was trying to write my doctoral dissertation. This is a bit unspoken, but in order to be a good graduate student, and not just a graduate student, actually an academic, I would say, because being a graduate student is preparing you to be an academic if you're going to go down that route is in some sense, you're expected to be good at eight or nine different skills that really don't connect with one another. Here's what I mean. If you are a good academic, you're a good researcher, you should be a good writer, maybe in both Turkish and English. If you want to be part of the international scholarly community, you have to write well in English, which is hard to do if you're not a native English speaker. You need to be a good teacher, also a good editor and proofreader. Maybe uh, translate foreign languages well. Uh, grant proposal writer, you need to get money for research grants, that's very important, and conference organizer. Here's what, here's what problem I had, at least for me. These skills don't necessarily connect together. And there's probably nobody who's excellent at all of these. Just about all of this are really good at maybe two or three of these things. We're average in the others, and then we're absolutely terrible in two or three. All of us have had a professor that was an excellent scholar and a horrible teacher. And we've all had the opposite as well. Someone who is an excellent teacher, but maybe not a good researcher. Maybe they couldn't even get tenure because they couldn't produce enough scholarship. Uh, now, here was something that I thought of, and there's kind of a bias and idea that you need to be good at all of these. My weakness was this. Uh, I study Ottoman history. If any of you have studied Ottoman Turkish, you know it's a difficult language. Uh, it's Arabic, Persian, Turkish. It's, it's an elite language. It's challenging. For a non-Turkish person, it's exceptionally challenging. Um, I didn't begin to even learn Turkish until I was 22 or 23. And then to add Ottoman Turkish on that was very hard. Now, 
problem in Turkish is hard for everyone, but I would argue that Turks have an advantage because in some ways it's your language. If I say the word um, you don't use that word, but most of you would know what that means. When I first read that, I had no idea what that is, so I had to look at my Red House dictionary and that's what it means. It's just, oh, it was, I wanted a better payoff than that. So what I realized was my weakness was um, research language. I'm a competent Ottoman, I, I knew Ottoman Turkish, I could read it, but when I had to do transcription from Ottoman Turkish and, or do the transliteration into Latin characters, or if I wanted to translate a passage into English, my confidence wasn't as very high that it was absolutely right. So what I did was uh, I worked with somebody who was exceptional at that skill, and then I would help them with whatever they were poor at. You know, God forbid we actually collaborate with other people. But um, I worked with somebody who was uh, applying for a doctoral program in the United States. And I have a writing background. I work as a journalist, and I can um, write in a clear, concise way, and I helped him with all of his application materials. So I helped him with all of those things, and he was a graduate from Marmara University's Ilahiyat Fakultesi. His language was very good. And he looked over my transliterations to say, uh, you're missing the shakala uh, here, uh, no, this is wrong. Or he could say, well, you translated this way, uh, this is a little bit better. So. If you're really worried, if there's one of these things that you think, oh no, I'm really bad at one of these, um, I can't finish my program unless I fix it. Now, to a degree, you have to have a base level of competency. If you can't do math, then you shouldn't do a master's in applied mathematics, but none of us are absolutely wonderful at all of these things. All of us have a weakness, but I think that you do yourself a favor if you can work together with someone who is strong in the area you are weakest, and then you can help them in wherever you are strongest. Okay, this is the last thing I want to mention, and then we'll get to uh, the Q&A. The last thing I want to mention is how to get your friends to help you finish. I talked earlier, and I said that the best advice I can give you is to write every day. That's the biggest differentiator if you succeed or if you fail. And I told you that you should write five times in order to make sure that you develop a writing habit. But I think this is so important that I want to mention one last thing about how to develop a daily writing habit. Here's what you do. You get your friends to help you. And they don't have to be academics. They don't have to know about anything. How do you get your friends to help you? You get them to help you by letting them punish you. Here's what I mean. Give your friend, let's say, access to your uh, spreadsheets where you have your daily writing goal listed, your 200 words a day, your 500 words a day, and you tell them, if I don't meet my daily writing goal, I owe you 10 lira. I owe you 5 lira. Even if it's only 1 lira, it goes back to the theory of loss prevention, that our brain registers pain at something that you lose. You can take this a step further if you want to be absolutely sure that if you fulfill it. Here's one thing you can do. You can say to your friend, here's 10 lira right now. Just hold on to it. If I don't meet my daily writing goal, I want you to give this money to somebody, to somebody that I hate more than anyone else. <laughs> Tell them it's from me, and then don't give any explanation why it's from you. So, I want to give you an example of how this works out. Uh, this is a book called uh, Drop Dead Healthy, uh, the author A.J. Jacobs. He did something like this. This is a really funny book. It was written by a journalist in New York, and he had a goal where in one year's time he wanted to become the healthiest person in the world. Uh, he was unhealthy. It's more of a, like a social commentary book about the health industry in uh, the Western world. But here's what he did. He noticed that he couldn't get healthy because every day he would eat dried mangoes or dried fruit. He said, it looks like it's healthy, but really it's just sugar. So here's what he did to use this theory of loss prevention to make sure he would stop eating it. He wrote out a check for $1,000 and he gave it to his wife and it was written for the American Nazi party. And he's Jewish, so he's obviously not a fan of the Nazis. 
And he said, if I eat one mango, I want you to take this check and I want you to give it to the American Nazi party. And he said that something triggered in his brain where whenever he would see mangoes, he would look in horror. It was like if you were in a romantic relationship with someone and you found out they were your long lost brother or sister. So how can you do this for yourself? Maybe give money to a friend who will keep you honest and say, okay, this political party, I hate them more than anyone else, or whatever. Whatever makes you angriest, give money to your friend and say, give this to that organization or this person in my name if I don't make my daily writing goal. Uh, this is also known as the uh, Odysseus contract from the Odyssey, where um, Odysseus is tied up to the ship masts when they go by the sirens. Because he knows that if he hears the sirens, he's going to jump off the ship. He knows that his future self will fail, so he takes out insurance against his future self. So that's one way you can do it. And I didn't do as extreme version of this, but here's what I did. Uh, I have a budget, and um, my wife and I have a budget, and I said, if I don't meet my writing goal, then I owe you one lira. And, but it actually worked. I mean, it's, it's nothing. I mean, I think I only failed one or two times in the entire writing of my dissertation. Like, that was the least extreme version of the way I could do this, and it still works. So anything you can set up like this will have the impact you're looking for. Okay, so I want to mention one more thing before we get to the Q&A. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, the recording of this, I think it'll be on the Shea here uh, history page website. Um, also, I have a short ebook that is on, uh, if you go to Google Books, if you have an Android phone, I think most of you have it. If you look for this, how to finish your dissertation in six months, uh, if you don't know what to write, this is almost all the same information of what I said. Uh, you can get this absolutely free. It's just available there. Uh, other sites, I think if you have an um, iPhone, the iBook store, you can also get it for free. But if you look around, you'll be able to find it somewhere. Okay, and also, I am here at Chahir University until uh, the end of this term, until June. And if any of you ever have any more questions, or if you want to email me, uh, you're free to do so. There's my Chahir email. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for showing up. And if you have any questions now, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah. Do you recommend that we start the editing process once we've done the entire thesis, or should we do that chapter by chapter? seems from your presentation that you did it once you were done with the entire mm -hmm. uh, thesis, is that right? That's right. Uh, I would recommend you don't edit until then because, at least for me, I would often find out that information worked better in another place uh, in my thesis. Or, uh, because when I first wrote, it would be chronological, I would group things according to years, but then I. I, I knew that it wouldn't be a straight chronology because that's not good history because I wanted to group things thematically. So in order to give myself maximum flexibility on the first stage, I would uh, not worry about the editing until the end. Uh, because if I had done that, then I'd start to feel boxed in and I wouldn't kind of have the flexibility that I wanted to when I was first doing it. I noticed that you were writing in chapters. You said you were writing separately. Mm -hmm. Right, well, uh, yeah, thank you, that's a good point. Uh, I did make a chapter structure. And I had already done some research when I started writing. So you can't do this the first day of your MA program. Um, you have to have like some baseline of research and some general idea about what your topic will be. But I think most of you, by the time you have finished your coursework and you're ready to write, you're, I, I would think most of us are well past this stage uh, at some point. So. What I did was I, I had a general outline. I, I had a sense of where the information would go. And I did have to change it. I think between my third and my fourth edit, my professor told me that I need to add an entire additional chapter to link the early modern and the modern epochs in the Ottoman Empire, just to kind of bridge these research fields. Um, so it was something that came later, but if you move things around, then uh, that's fine. As long as you have a general structure to build on, you don't have to stay with it. If you need to 
really rework it or rechange it or throw it out, that um, that will definitely happen. Uh, here's one other thing I want to mention about my editing process. The first draft that I wrote was where I just put all the information on the page. And then my second draft I showed you, I put the paper on the ground and I started to go through and edit it. It was after I finished that second draft that I finally showed it to my advisor. Then I was able to start paying the critical feedback to go back and edit it. If I were, how do I say, some people don't know when to show things to their advisor, but in my personal opinion, do it as soon as you have something halfway respectable to show. Because if I had gone through like five or six edits before I showed my advisor, I might have been going completely the wrong direction on something. And they would have said, whoa, 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 you have this concept completely wrong. And there was something that, there was, I had to rework the concept of Ottoman modernity, which is a central idea in my thesis. But because I showed it after the second copy, I was able to rework that earlier on and fix it um, so I didn't get so tied down. But if I would have been really insecure and thought, well, I have to go through it six times before I uh, show it to my professor, or they won't think I'm really smart. Well, your, your professor knows your flaws, uh, for better or for worse. Um, you can't really, I think, trick them into like making them think you know something that you don't. So you want to do your best, but I would say it's better to do it slightly earlier so you don't waste too much time uh, going after a completely uh, fruitless research track or uh, research path. Uh, here's how I'll, I'll break down my process. So the first draft, I didn't send it um, because I knew that if this were something that I would have sent, I would have been much more nervous about it, but I wanted the freedom to be able to write clearly. Then in the second draft, I knew that I would send it. I think I had to go through about uh, six drafts total uh, for it to be finished, but that was for a doctoral dissertation. Uh, for a master's thesis, it might be fewer. And also, you'll be able to go back and forth a lot faster because it's shorter. But each time I went back and forth, it was shorter than the time before. When I sent it to my professors the first time, um, it, the first rewrite that I had to do after the comments, uh, I think took maybe two or three months. And then the second time was about one month. And then the third or fourth time was about two weeks. Once you get to the point where you realize you're just changing some tiny things here and there, and you're getting down into all the little grammar mistakes and punctuation mistakes, then I think you realize, OK, I'm, I'm basically about finished here. So what did you do about reporting? About reporting? Yeah, I'm doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would uh, keep them updated with what I was doing. And I, uh, that was something I didn't get to in this topic. Uh, it's things I've mentioned before on how to uh, have a good uh, meeting with your advisor. I, I always recommend if you're going to meet with your advisor, before you meet them, send a short email of maybe like, hello, professor so-and-so. Here, are, this is what I'm working on. And then maybe five bullet points. And then after that, say, this is what I want to do. So tell them what you are doing. And that way, when you begin the meeting, they'll, know, they'll be able to give you very specific advice. But if you just show up and start explaining it, you can forget things, or maybe they make you nervous, and you'll, you'll leave things out. But it can just make the meeting a lot more productive. And if, for me, I was in a different country with my professor, and I couldn't talk to them very often, so I had to be as specific as I could in the meetings. But yeah, I would tell them that I was writing. And when I told them that I was work, when I told them I was doing a first draft that they wouldn't see, I don't even think I told them that, but I just let them know that I was making writing progress and that was fine. Um, and it was much, much, much faster doing a first draft that they wouldn't read and then going back and fixing it than trying to write a perfect first draft. Uh, this method was much faster uh, and 
Uh, so I, I, I would think that as long as they know you're making writing progress, they'll be happy. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing too, um, I was going to mention but I decided not to for the sake of time. When I was doing the reading to prepare for my dissertation, if I would read a book or an article, after I read two or three pages, I would make some notes to myself and I would put this in a big Google document. So if I read uh, an article about um, press censorship during uh, the Kinji Abdul Hamid's period, I would have, say, on page 12, he says this. On page 14, he says this. I would write notes because when it came to writing my dissertation, I could easily and quickly go back to that information and summarize the content. If I read something, I'm not going to remember it. It's If I read something and try to come back to it in two months, I might as well have never read it because I'll, I, I won't know where to find it. So by keeping little notes of the things that I read, um, probably 95% of my dissertation I was able to write based off of just those notes. Uh, it also keeps you from plagiarism, which is good, because uh, you're just dealing with the general concepts. Uh, I would go back to it, of course, if I, if I wasn't sure I remembered it correctly, or if I wanted to do a direct quote, then of course I would go back. But uh, yeah, just a little bit more note taking in the beginning. Maybe it takes 10% longer to read something, but when it comes to the writing, it's 90% faster. So that's something that made a big difference as well. Yeah, yeah. my question is about, uh, you start typing, uh, writing the thesis, you start completely finishing the uh, literature review. Mm -hmm. Sorry about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, you keep a certain percentage to do it, let's say 50%, 60% of the literature review that has to be finished before typing it, mm -hmm. or it, it, it's all, all, always the difference between disciplines and disciplines, mm -hmm. but is there, th th there's a certain risk mm -hmm. about it because when you keep reading it, it's never ending story. Right. Yeah. Just keep reading and you just forget what you read mm -hmm. and you'll find some inconsistency about it, but if you don't uh, write it down, it goes away and it's a right. double, never ending process. So mm -hmm. what's the percentage that worked for you? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question about the literature review because it's always expanding and there's always new things being added to it. Um, this was part of my dissertation that was finished uh, for the most part before I uh, got into my research. But And a lot of this I got out of my qualifications exams. But what I did was that I one of the first things I wrote was the introductory chapter where I did the literature review. Then I did the first draft of the rest of my dissertation. Then I came back and I polished off the literature review, like you said, to incorporate some of the new things that were added or that had been found. But also to see that, huh, I, I addressed topics in my thesis that I didn't think I would. Because of that, I need to do, I need to write about some other topics and address some other things in the literature. Um, so doing that way helped because I was able to uh, not feel like I was locked in. Uh, since, well, I did this literature review so I can only research on this topic. I felt more freedom that way. Yeah, and that's the challenge of, um, kind, kind of the bigger challenge of knowing when to finish where it can't be perfect so at some point it comes time to stop. And personally, that's why I, I much prefer the European model and I think Shay here hues more closely to this where it pushes people to get done uh, a little bit faster rather than like the 12 or 14 year model of the University of Chicago where it just goes on forever. Yeah. Anything else? Um, not a question but a comment maybe. Uh, I think uh, the uh, most important thing in the writing 
a clear mind, <laughs> but it's it, uh, impossible, impossible yeah. most of the time. Uh, we have a life and the life problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it can, uh, they can be, uh, they can change uh, life problems. Yeah, uh, budget or family problems, or a lack of uh, area to study. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how how can we deal with these problems? Maybe, maybe you don't have an answer. Uh, I think uh, it's a hard question, but mm -hmm. I want to hear your comments. That, yeah, that's a very good question because we would like to separate our uh, master's or doctoral student life from our other life, but we can't, so we have to deal with it. Um, I did a couple things to motivate myself. One was, when I was writing my doctoral dissertation, I went into the library and I found other uh, doctoral dissertations from our history department that had been written in the past. And I tried to find the absolute worst one that I could. And I found one, there was something about communism in Croatia. It was, it was only like 170 pages long, which for history is really short. The English was terrible and it was, I thought, how did this get passed? And I looked at the professors on the doctoral committee, I thought, They're, I, I've had classes with these people, they're really critical, how did they pass this thing? And I thought, huh, if they pass this, I can write better than this. <laughs> so I started to feel a lot better at myself, that, okay, I can do this, I can write, I can at least do this much better. Um, so that's how, it, it actually ha had a big help, knowing, well, I can at least clear this bar, and I can, I can do this much better than they did. Um, the other thing about how to juggle all these responsibilities is just about whatever difficulty you have in finishing it. And some of us have big challenges in finishing our thesis. Maybe you have to work full time. Maybe you are, maybe you have a child. Maybe whatever. You have some type of big time responsibility. For me, my first child was born uh, when I, no, my second child was born when I was writing my dissertation. And I thought, like, <laughs> how do I do this? I mean, other people in my department have way more time than I do. But then I heard of somebody who was writing it who had four children, and they were working full time. So whatever situation you're in, there's someone out there who has it worse than you do. Uh, and I realized that, that I could feel sorry for myself, but um, yeah, there were people who had to work 50 or 60 hours a week, and they had multiple children, and they had it way worse than I did. Uh, so I would say, uh, with the writing habit thing that I mentioned, I said that I had a goal of 500 words a day. Even if you don't have much free time, even if you only have an hour a day, and you can only write 100 words, I hope you can write more than that, but if you can just have a daily goal, whatever you can do, do that, and it's not about writing a lot on a Saturday, it's about making regular progress. Uh, I, I have a friend who's an author, he's not um, an academic, but the way that he writes books is he has a smartphone and as he's uh, going to work, he just speaks into it. And the smartphone has voice recording and it records what he's saying and it produces a transcript. And he uses that as the basis for the books that he does. So he just find, he uses time that he would waste anyway just driving to work and he uses that to make books. So uh, whatever tiny little bit of time you do have, if you can, you, if you can do it every single day, that will total up into something pretty large over time. 